Okay, so in this video, this is my third video in my cell communication series, and we're going to be looking at how signal transduction pathways are used to help cells uh, respond to their environment. So uh, in our first example, we're going to use epinephrine in the fight or flight response, which you should be familiar with it from my previous video. And if you're not, it might be helpful to watch video 4.2. Okay, so epinephrine is a hormone that is released in times of like immediate stress. And so it's a way that our body can respond in a fight or flight situation. So if you're walking down the street and there's a loose dog that comes charging at you, like how is your body going to respond? Right? So here we release epinephrine from our adrenal glands. So it'll travel in our bloodstream. And when it reaches, for example, uh, maybe our liver cells. So it will travel throughout our whole body and it will have different cell responses depending on the cell it attaches to. But in this example, I'm going to use a liver cell. So here it attaches to a transmembrane protein receptor because it is a protein-based hormone. And basically, when that receptor receives the ligand, the epinephrine, it goes through a conformational change in shape, which will activate a G protein. And when we say activate a G protein, what that means is the GDP comes off, it basically dissociates, dissociates and instead a GTP replaces that GDP. So now we have an active alpha subunit of the G protein. Now this activated alpha subunit of the G protein will then go and activate uh, adenylyl cyclase. And adenylyl cyclase is also a transmembrane protein that acts as an enzyme. So here, once adenylyl cyclase is active, it can take ATP and convert it into cyclic AMP, which is our second messenger. So these signal transduction pathways oftentimes rely on the second messenger or proteins within the cell to relay these signals. Epinephrine itself is like trapped on the outside of the cell because it's protein based and can't enter by diffusion. Therefore, it needs like help on the inside to relay that message. And that's where a lot of proteins come into play. Uh, we have different kinds of proteins like G proteins and kinases and enzymes and transcription factors, etc. But basically, they're all working together in like a series of events to bring a cell response. So here, this um, adenylocyclase protein produces a second messenger called cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP will activate another protein called protein kinase A. And kinases are proteins that phosphorylate other proteins. And when you phosphorylate a protein, it basically makes it active. So here we can see how protein kinase A is going to phosphorylate protein kinase 1, which then phosphorylates protein kinase 2, which basically by the time you get to the end of the signal transaction pathway or the phosphorylation cascade uh, and you're ready for that cell response, what's going to happen here is this protein kinase 2 which does have a more scientific name, but I'm doing general right now, uh, will actually help to bring about the cell response, which is to take that polysaccharide of glycogen and hydrolyze it into individual glucose molecules, glucose monomers that can be used in cellular respiration to help you in that fight or flight response. Remember, it was a dog coming at you. You're going to need ATP in order to fight that dog and defend yourself or to run from that dog. Uh, either way, you will need an increase in blood sugar. And that's what this cell response is producing. Okay, good. So now let's go ahead and look at another example. So here, uh, what happens if it's like after dinner, you just had a big meal, maybe it was pasta um, or something, and then you follow it up with some ice cream. And so now your blood sugar levels are really high. So instead of an external environment, we saw it with epinephrine in the fight or flight response. Now we're looking at a change of an internal environment, a hot, like a heightened like blood sugar. So how do we lower it so we can maintain homeostasis, right? So here, uh, one of the things that will happen is our pancreas, is beta cells, will produce insulin and send it into our bloodstream. Well, when insulin reaches a target cell, there are receptor proteins for that insulin molecule. The insulin here is a ligand. When insulin attaches 
to these receptor proteins, they form a dimer and become activated. So now the intracellular region of these receptors, the part that's within the cell, is going to activate a family of proteins um, called the insulin receptor substrate proteins, the IRS proteins. And basically, you have a bunch of these proteins becoming activated. Um, and eventually, they'll activate a kinase. And that kinase can then activate other proteins to bring about a variety of cell responses. So some of the cell responses might be lipid metabolism or glycogen synthesis. Think about this. We take glucose and hook it together in a chain called glycogen. So it makes sense that a cell response would be to build the polysaccharide and lower the sugar from our blood. Okay, but now you may be thinking back to when you learned about facilitated diffusion and how glucose can enter a cell from a high concentration to a low concentration through a channel protein, like a protein carrier. It just diffuses through those proteins into the cell. And if you're thinking that, you might be wondering, well, why do I need insulin then? Why doesn't the glucose just diffuse into the cell? Well, we need to put the um, channel proteins there. We got to put the proteins that are used in facilitated diffusion up into the cell membrane. So now another like kind of important cell response would be to activate a series of proteins that are going to take this vesicle. So here we have a GLUT4 transport vesicle. And that black line you see in the circle is a lipid bilayer. So that's like the same stuff that is made of the cell membrane. And then those proteins, those purple things, are all of the proteins uh, that would be used for facilitated diffusion. So basically, this GLUT4 vesicle will move to the cell membrane. And I know I don't have it shown here, but you can visualize kind of like um, endocytosis. No, no, I'm sorry, exocytosis, sorry, <laughs> where like the um, vesicle like fuses and becomes part of that cell membrane, but you can see how the movement, the translocation, like the moving through the cell of that GLUT4 vesicle, move, like put those protein channels up into the cell membrane. So here we have a facilitated diffusion carrier protein that allows for the glucose to now enter into the cell, which ultimately will lower our blood sugar and bringing us back to homeostasis. So now you can see how that insulin, that ligand, it was the signal transduction pathway that connected us to the final cell response of lowering blood sugar. Um, later on in my next video, 4.4, we'll look at some errors in pathways. And basically in diabetes, for example, in type 1 diabetes, uh, the pancreas does not make insulin. So therefore, this whole signal transduction pathway and cell response would not happen. In type 2 diabetes, the insulin is there, but the receptor is not very sensitive. It's like insulin insensitive. And so basically, it kind of ignores the insulin. And therefore, there's no uh, protein cascade within the cell activated. So it have the same outcome. A, a still high blood sugar. Okay, so now let's look at uh, plants. So plants have hormones as well. Uh, and one of their hormones, which I think is pretty cool, is a gas hormone called ethylene. Now, ethylene is the hormone involved in fruit ripening. So if you've ever heard the terms like a, a one rotten apple spoils the whole bunch. Um, plants, they produce this ripening hormone um, when it's time to ripen, like when they receive a signal that it's time to ripen, but also um, during like like a mechanical stress. And so I have like my can of oh here my can of water right here. Um, but basically, imagine that this red can of water was an apple. Like if the apple got like dented or bruised, now that like mechanical stress would actually cause this apple to start to release ethylene. And so basically, like let's take that uh, really. Um, right banana at the bottom there, that those green diamonds represent ethylene. Now, since it's a gas, it can spread to the other fruits nearby and turn on their signal transaction pathways for ripening. So it basically causes like a chain reaction of ripening. And so um, ethylene production 
is actually a positive feedback loop. If you have one banana or apple sending out ethylene, then you'll have more and then more and then more. Uh, this is also helpful if you buy some avocados. Put them in a brown paper bag with a spotted banana. That spotted banana is going to send out a lot of ethylene, causing your avocados to ripen faster. But now let's go ahead and see how ethylene brings about a cell response. So we're going to look at the cell on the left first. So this is actually something new. So when we look at these receptor proteins, you notice there is no ethylene attached. So when these receptor proteins are in this state, they actually will activate a kinase called CTR1. And this CTR1 kinase will actually inhibit this transmembrane protein called EIN2. So here, this blue transmembrane protein is inhibited by this kinase. And so with that, um, this would actually uh, prevent ripening from happening. So when there is no ethylene, basically the pathway is inhibited by this active kinase. So it's kind of cool. Anytime you see that T shape in a pathway, it's meaning it inhibits or blocks or prevents. Uh, so now though, what happens when ethylene does attach? So look, when ethylene attaches, when the ligand attaches, it causes a conformational change in shape. Now look what happens to that CTR1 kinase. That uh, change in shape will actually inhibit that CTR1 kinase protein. Now, the EIN2 transmembrane protein is now able to become active because it's no longer being inhibited. And now that EIN2 or EIN2 can actually uh, produce a second messenger. And that second messenger can start the signaling cascade that leads to activating transcription factors which are just proteins, within the nucleus of that cell, which basically leads to the whole ethylene responses of the fruit ripening. So this was our first example of a signal transaction pathway that relied on inhibiting other molecules instead of always just activating them. Okay, we're going to look at our last um, protein-based hormone uh, example. So here, uh, our cells, when we talk about um, how you get from like a sperm swimming into an egg and you're one cell big, and now as like a teenager, adult, or however old you are, you are made of like 30 to 40 trillion cells. So your one cell divided and became two by mitosis, and then four, and then eight, 16, 32, 64, et cetera. And you just kept dividing. And now let's pretend you get a cut. Now, when you get cut in your skin, how do your skin cells know to divide? Right? So like damaged skin cells, uh, there's actually like certain chemicals, ligands, that will be sent out to nearby cells to signal it's time for cell division. So here we have what's called epidermal growth factor. So when you hear the word growth factor, that's part of growth. How do we grow? By mitosis, by our cells dividing. Our cells don't get bigger when we grow, but rather you get more cells during growth spurts. So let's go ahead and see what happens uh, in the process of a cell receiving a signal, which it will use to then divide as its final cell response. And we will revisit this when we get to the cell cycle part of unit four. Okay, so here we have our, our um, transmembrane receptor proteins. And when that um, EGF attaches, the ligand attaches to those receptor proteins, they form a dimer, and now they're active. And now they can like phosphorylate and activate proteins within the cell, intracellularly. So we have a group of proteins here that kind of relay the message on these relay proteins that ultimately, like we are interested in this RAS protein right here. So this RAS protein is actually going to become active by those relay proteins. So it will like donate its GDP and that will be replaced with a GTP. So now we have an active RAS. And this RAS is pretty important because now it's gonna activate RAF, which is a kinase. So as we've learned, kinases activate proteins by phosphorylating them. So now the MEK protein will be phosphorylated and we'll start the phosphorylation cascade where ultimately 
we're going to end up within the nucleus. And here, this ERK uh, active protein is going to then phosphorylate the transcription factor needed to turn on gene expression uh, for any genes that are required, or not any, but to turn on specific genes that are needed for cell division and cell growth to kind of control that cell cycle and to help the cell move through G1, SG2, and M phase. So epidermal growth factor. Um, I also want to point out when we get to the part of our unit about cancer, uh, we're going to revisit this pathway and RAS. In about 30% of human cancers and tumor growth, tumors are uncontrolled cell growth. So in those situations, 30% of the time, this RAS is active even without the ligand attaching. So imagine no ligand attaches. There's no relay proteins, but RAS is just active, continually causing this pathway to go. That's one of the reasons why a tumor may have uncontrolled cell growth. Okay, and our last example, though, is now going to look at uh, steroid hormones. Because steroid hormones, or steroid-based ligands, are different than protein-based ones. Because steroid-based ligands can diffuse right through the lipid bilayer of the cell membrane, as well as the nuclear envelope. So their protein receptor is within the cell. And so here I'm using testosterone as my example. So together, they're going to act as a transcription factor, which basically means it activates or turns on gene expression. So uh, this RNA polymerase and transcription is a separate unit and subject in biology. Um, but basically, that's what happens. Now, this gene that was just activated, like if this is a male going through puberty, for example, that messenger RNA or that gene that was just transcribed may be a gene for like um, causing the changes that cause a voice to deepen or an increase in muscle mass and a growth spurt or facial hair or armpit hair. Like all of the changes you go through with puberty is due to our sex hormones turning on gene expression um, during puberty. Once those genes get turned on and activated, now we go through uh, puberty basically. Okay, so that is my video on examples of how signal transduction pathways are used to connect um, a signal to a final cell response. All right, good job.